holds a BSc in nursing, masters in health system management with 15 years experience working in pediatrics. He has contributed to the development of various national pediatric guidelines, including the national vaccine and immunization curriculum and training programs. He's also a trainer in the emergency care courses. Mr. Jason, welcome. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, I think it's the technology which, uh, yeah, thank you. So we can go on. Um, so we are using the, 
the National Vaccine and Immunization Program uh, guidelines. And this is a program that uh, we said it uh, adapt, implement, and update the national vaccination schedule using the best global practice, using uh, guidance from WHO position papers uh, on uh, specific vaccines, also using local disease epidemiology and uh, local priorities, and also getting advice from the Kenya National Immunization Technical Advisory Group and other local advisory bodies. Yeah, you can remember this advisory group was uh, quite active during the recent uh, guidelines on um, COVID vaccines. So the national schedule aims to aid decision-making by providers of immunization services, so as to avoid ambiguity and uh, around vaccine doses and how to schedule them. So schedules for different vaccines offered by the NVIP will be harmonized as much as possible uh, to minimize the number of visits uh, to the facility by the caregivers. So the National Vaccine and Immunization Program uh, will provide a certain mandated vaccine for free of charge to the clients through public, uh, faith-based and private health providers. So private health providers providing other vaccines and biologicals that may not be available through the public national schedule will also follow the guidance from the government, from the Ministry of Health through the National Vaccines and Immunization Program. Okay, so this is the national uh, vaccine, uh, immu the, the national routine immunization schedule, which starts at birth, we give BCG and uh, OPV0, the oropario vaccine given at birth. Then uh, six weeks, we do the pentavalent PCV1, OPV2, and the rotavirus vaccine. So this is the, nas the national uh, immunization schedule. And this is a schedule you'll find in the mother and child booklet. So uh, the, that the six weeks vaccine dosage is repeated at 10 weeks. So where we have the pentavalent, pentavalent has the diphtheria, pertussis and tetanus, and it has a Mophila's influenza type B vaccine and hepatitis B vaccine. So you get the second doses at week 10, and then you get the PCV, this pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. The second dose is given at week 10. Then uh, OPV3, remember we gave the OPV at birth at 10 weeks, and then at, uh, and then at 10 weeks, and then we have the rotavirus vaccine. Okay, so uh, the same is repeated at week, uh, not the same exactly, but there are changes at 14 weeks. We have the pentavalent, that is the DPT, a, a Mophila's influenza type B, hepatitis B. Then you have the PCV, the third dose. Then we have the OPV, the fourth dose. And now we have an additional uh, vaccine, which is uh, the inactivated polio vaccine, which is given as an injection. So we have the, the rotavirus at week six, and as week 10, then there's a new vaccine, the inactivated polio vaccine at week 14. So that uh, the initial 14 weeks, then at uh, six months, we start vitamin A supplementation, that will be the, the first dose is usually 100,000 international units. And you and MR, that is measles and rubella, is given in HIV exposed children or during an outbreak, during a measles outbreak. So um, the vaccine vaccination starts earlier if there's an outbreak and start at six months. And then in HIV exposed children, you'll start the MR, the missiles, 
and rubella vaccination at six months. So the routine MR, measles and rubella, it's given at nine months. Then remember, we give vitamin A every six months. So the next dosage is at uh, one year and it's usually at 200,000 uh, international units. So you'll give every six months up to uh, the age of five years. So then these are booster that we, we are now giving for MR, measles and rubella at 18 months. And that also corresponds with the with the third vitamin A supplementation. So the, after that, in our national schedule, we'll continue with, with um, we'll, we'll, so for that, we'll continue with, um, so we'll continue with, with the vitamin A until it's, until, uh, 10 years when we now introduce the uh, HPV, human papilloma virus vaccine, and that is now being given for girls 10 years and older, and you give two doses six months apart. So this is what is in the national immunization schedule starting from birth up to 10 years. So. So your OPV, just to alight that OPV zero at birth should be given within two weeks as all subsequent doses must be given at intervals of four weeks. So if you, if you, give, if you give the, the birth one at two weeks, the child will still come six weeks later, get the, the next, a, a vaccine and then you space them every six weeks, every four weeks, sorry. So you'll space them every four weeks. So the subsequent doses are given with intervals of uh, four weeks, the same way we gave the six weeks, 10 weeks and 14 weeks. Okay. So if there is any delay in administering the six week vaccine, Subsequent doses are also to be given four weeks with four weeks spacing. So maybe the child comes eight weeks later, two months. So you give the, the second OPV, then you'll wait another four weeks, then give, this, uh, give, give the next OPV. And it, that means all the, all the vaccines given at six weeks um, will have been delayed. So you'll make sure that you space the subsequent vaccines with the same spacing of four weeks as it was in the original schedule. So that means if there's any delay when to start, you continue as if there was no delay and you make sure that there is a spacing of the four weeks. Okay, so this slide compares the vaccines avail available in the National Vaccines and Immunization Program schedule and uh, the other vaccines available in, um, in the private facilities. As we said, uh, it, it's good to know what uh, happenings in all sectors and the vaccines, though they may not be available in the national uh, schedule, the could be beneficial and it's only that the, the resources may not allow uh, to give these vaccines to everyone, but it's good that um, we get to know what's available and how the vaccines are used. We have looked the, through the National Vaccine and Immunization Schedule. This slide summarizes. So at birth, if you are to compare, we have in the national shade, we have the BCG and OPV0. Then in the private sector, we have um, a number of facilities giving the hepatitis B vaccine at birth. So that, uh, that are different. So there is a hepatitis B vaccine given at birth. At six, 10 and 14 weeks, um, the schedule looks more or less the same. We have the pentavalent, we have the first dose at six, uh, 
second dose at 10 weeks and the third dose at uh, 14 weeks. So you can see there's also availability of the exavalent in the, in the private sector, which combines the vaccine and includes the IPV, the inactivated polio vaccine into one jab. The other difference is that for the DPT in the public sector, we have the DPT with the whole cell and we have the DPT with the acellular, uh, the acellular vaccine. Okay, so there, there is, there is um, there's a talk of uh, the D, the acellular vaccine being uh, having less uh, side effects, uh, but uh, the protection should be the same for, for both the whole cell and the acellular uh, vaccines. So uh, sorry, uh, so the. That's the difference between the private and the public. So we can have the availability of the exavalent, which includes the inactivated polio vaccine as one job. So there has the, in the public sector, we are giving the inactivated polio vaccine at 14 weeks. So the, okay, that also makes sure that the coverage is, it's, 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 it's done. So then the other difference is, um, is that the, the pneumococcal vaccine, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So we are giving in the public sector, mostly the PCV10. So it covers the, the, the 10 zero groups or in the private sector, you can have the PCV13, which uh, covers the uh, 13 zero groups of the pneumococcal um, uh, bank. So the rotavirus vaccine is it's also available and you can have some centers with, which give the third rotavirus vaccine. So in the public sector, we give two uh, rotavirus vaccines. Okay, so we can still also have some sectors which are still giving the IPV1, especially if they didn't have the exavalent, the vaccine which has already has the IPV the inactivated polio vaccine. So, uh, so for, the, for the first 14 weeks, that the, the similarities and the differences, the difference being the use of the exavalent in some center, use of PCV13 and use of the additional um, rotavirus vaccine, and also use of the acellular pertussis. A vaccine. So at six months in the public sector, we give vitamin A only. And then in the private sector, flu vaccine, they can give in um, the two doses. Uh, it can be given within the year. So it's, we have the flu vaccine available. At nine months, we have the MR, the muscles rubella vaccine being available and yellow fever in some selected uh, place, counties so that we have the yellow fever being available. So uh, in the private sector, so they also have the MR, muscles and rubella uh, vaccine being available. And or they also have the MMR, which is the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. So there's addition of the mumps vaccine to the MR. So yellow fever is also available, and the meningococcal conjugate vaccine. And the one available locally covers the serum group A, C, Y, and W. You can also have the meningococcal vaccine, the first dose being given at nine months. So at uh, one year to 15 months uh, in the public sector, we give the second supplementation of vitamin A. So in the private sector, we still give the vitamin A. So also available at this age, there is a cholera vaccine, can give uh, two doses. Um, so then we have also the varicella uh, vaccine that's for chicken pox available at um, one year. And then the hepatitis A vaccine also available at one year. And this is a time you also give the second dose of the meningococcal uh, vaccine. 
at uh, 18 months to two years, we give vitamin A in the public sector. So the third, the, the third supplementation and also we give the booster of the measles rubella vaccine. Uh, so at 18 to 24 months in the private sector, we have also supplementation of vitamin A. We are giving either the, the booster of the, either the MR, the measles rubella, or the measles, uh, mumps and rubella uh, second dose. Also, we have hepatitis A, the second for those who received that one year. So we can give the second dose now. So there's also uh, the fourth dose of the exavalent, like a booster, which comes at uh, two years. So the exavalent for those who had started with the exavalent. And also another booster of the PCV13, also at at, at, at two, two years. So the additional there is the exavalent and the PCV13 as a booster. So for two to five years, so, sorry. For two to five years, we are continuing with the measles. Sorry. So for two to five years, we are continuing with the vitamin A by annual every six months, we are giving vitamin A supplementation. Then in the private sector or as additional vaccines, we have the typhoid vaccine. We have the annual, um, this the annual flu vaccine, which uh, started at six months, can be, the child can be getting the annual flu vaccines. So we also have the a booster of the deep, of the tetanus, diphtheria, and their cellular pertussis, and the IPV. It's called the travalent. It can also be given at this age. At ten years, we in the national schedule we are giving HPV four. Uh, the first dose at ten years. And then six months later, the second dose for girls. So available in the private sector at 10 years, we also have the HPV4. We have HPV2 that we said this is a human papilloma virus vaccine. We have also HPV9. HPV9 is given also two doses, one and two. They are, all of them are given two doses, six months apart but HPV9 is available for both girls and the boys. So this is the time you can also give, you can also give a booster of the tetanus, diphtheria, and uh, a cellular pertussis, the trivalent, as a booster at 10 years. Uh, as you can see, there are vaccines which are available in the private sector, these ones which are in bold, and we see also the national schedule, uh, the national uh, vaccines and immunization programs advises also how these vaccines they can be uh, 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 they can be used. So though not uh, not the mandatory uh, vaccines that are available in the public sector, there are vaccines which also the Ministry of Health is aware of and is guiding on their utilization. And this the and providing a, a systematic way of being able to get additional vaccines if need be and when and how to get these vaccines. So we've seen the vitamin A supplementation. So we have seen about vitamin A supplementation. It's integrated into the routine childhood immunization schedule to enhance immunity of the most infectious diseases in under fives, because this is the most vulnerable group. And it helps to prevent uh, blindness associated with vitamin A deficiency. And so a child should get at least two doses before one year. So you get a six months and at one year. So thereafter, it's recommended that you supplement uh, every six months up to five years. Uh, 
and I think this one is going on well. So um, something else which has changed from the previous guidelines was the change of uh, T, TT to TD. So there was change from TT to TD, tetanus toxoid to tetanus diphtheria vaccine. So that's to enhance the coverage for diphtheria vaccination. So TD schedule for trauma and occupational prophylaxis. You give the first dose at the first contact or within the seven days of uh, injury. So it offers a meal, the duration of immunity is a meal. So it doesn't offer protection thereafter. So if you give uh, a second uh, TD dose, we said the TD is tetanus diphtheria dose, one month after the first TD, it uh, offers immunity of one to three years. So if you offer a third TD dose, six months after the second TD, it offers a immunity of up to uh, five years. So if you offer the fourth TD dose, one year after the third uh, TD dose of, of vaccines, it offers uh, immunity for up to uh, 10 years. Okay, so even it offer, then if you offer fifth dose one month after the fourth, then it gets even a much longer uh, immunity a pro a protection for up to 20 years. So remember, you said that uh, there was the shift from TT, which was tetanus toxoid, to TD, which is uh, tetanus and diphtheria vaccine. Okay. So additional uh, vaccination. So we're going to look at the rabies vaccination. Uh, so this is um, recommended for people who get exposure due to animal bites especially due to animal bites, dogs, um, uh, bats. So the, it, um, the, the recommended vaccine is the rabies vaccine. It's an inactivated uh, vaccine and it's given intramuscular. So, yeah, so the first dose is uh, given pre-exposure for people who are at risk. They can be the veterinary officers, wildlife officers, travelers to high rabies and zoo, and zoo, and zoo um, areas like those who visit caves where they are bats. So they can get uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So, so they, they are, it's given in um, two doses, uh, zero and, uh, and after seven days, and a booster up to one year. So post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, it's given in, in five doses from uh, day zero, then day three, day seven, day 14, and day 28. Okay, so it's, so this is vaccination with uh, no hemoglobin if case of, uh, minor scratches with no bleeding or leaks on the broken skin. So post-exposure prophylaxis in previously vaccinated uh, individual, like the one who may have gotten the pre-exposure prophylaxis, you get two doses at day zero and day three. Okay. So, so these need to include uh, rabies immunoglobulin, RIG, so it offers passive immunization and it's not available in the national vaccines and immunization program. It is part of the post-exposure prophylaxis for high-risk exposures where they include animal leaks to mucous membranes or uh, these transdermal bites or scratches. So these need to infiltrate the in and around the wound and then you give the remaining dose IM uh, 
opposite the vaccine site. So if you give the vaccine on the right, then you give the immunoglobulin on the left. So that around cleaning is also advised, even in the absence of um, rabies immunoglobulin. It may reduce the risk of rabies by close to 90%. So that's another special category of, uh, of, of vaccines and immunoglobulins available. So, and you've seen the rabies vaccine. You said it's an inactivated uh, vaccine given IM and can be given for post-exposure prophylaxis on day zero and day seven and uh, boosters every year. Then you can have uh, post-exposure prophylaxis given five doses from day zero, day three, day seven, day 14, and day 28. So for those who get exposed and were previously vaccinated, you give uh, days three, zero and day three. And then you have seen the use of rabies immunoglobulin and they used to infiltrate the area around the wound and you give the dose that remains IM. So these are uh, it. Another product that um, it's under the DNVIP is the, uh, the polyvalent anti-snake venom. It should be available in uh, most of our level, level four, level five hospitals, and there may be selected places where maybe snake bites are a problem. It should be availed in all snake bites. It should be gotten and be ready in all snake bite as most patient and clinician cannot identify this snake species so that we are using the polyvalent and snake venom and may present early with no sign of innovation to be able to tell what type of um, um, venom you're dealing with and should be administered where there are signs of systemic innovation or presence of severe local swelling so in this um, polyvalent snake venom, the same dose is given in children and adults and is given as IV infusion. Then tetanus containing vaccines are also administered and remember to follow any other specific snake bite guidelines. We had a CME on the same not long ago. So then uh, there's also the polio in supplementation immunization activity, SIS. So we, occasionally we'll see the Ministry of Health having the polio eradication campaigns. And this is a key strategy of the Global Polio Eradication Inif Initiative to interrupt uh, circulation of polio, vi polio virus. So it's given as a single dose of two drops orally during mass vaccination exercises to children um, less than five years, zero to 59 months, regardless of their previous immunization status. And many people have uh, questions around this time where there's so much vaccination going on. The rationale for that is to boost the immunity of the already immunized uh, children, the ones who are partially immunized and the non-immunized. Uh, most susceptible group. And we have said these are the under fives. So you want to boost, uh, it works like a booster. So in case anyone will worries why you're giving so many, it works like a booster for even for those who are already immunized. Uh, there are those who may get partial immunization. And then for those who are entirely non-immunized to get a chance to give uh, across the board, you, you you have the chance to also immunize those who are not being immunized. Okay. So other products that uh, are in, within the control of the national vaccines and immunization programs are the immunoglobulins, these the antibodies. So the immunoglobulins, the first one you have, you have already mentioned the human rabies immunoglobulin, then its indication is for the high risk exposure to rabies in previously unvaccinated person. And we have seen that you'll infiltrate in and around the wound. Remember to clean the wound thoroughly and 
the remaining you see this given IM, the opposite side where you've given the rabies vaccine. So then we also have hepatitis B immunoglobulins. So these are given to babies born to hepatitis B positive mother, and it's given within 12 hours of birth. It, it's also given due to exposure to hepatitis B. This can be either due to sexual contact, due to needle prick, or um, palm mucosa. So this, you can get the hepatitis B immunoglobulins uh, for uh, mostly prevention after exposure to a positive uh, case. So it's given together with the hepatitis B vaccine and also at different sites. So anti-D immunoglobulin, it's also quite used. It's given to all pregnant rhesus D negative women with every pregnancy or even abortion. So especially if the partner is uh, rhesus positive. So then we have the the varicella zoster immunoglobulins. This is given following exposure to varicella in immunocompromised persons, in newborns, whose mother had uh, chickenpox around the delivery time and in an immune pregnant. So then you get the, the immunoglobulins administered IM. Then we have the intravenous immunoglobulins, IVIG. So this is replacement therapy for antibody deficiency and given in Kawasaki disease and in immune thrombocytopenia, pupra in GBS, that will in Barre syndrome and also in lupus. The, the consideration here is it can interfere with mums, measles and rubella vaccine also varicella vaccine responses. And so you may need to delay vaccination until you've uh, given the immunoglobulin and later and you can be able to vaccinate. So then other special groups that we give uh, vaccinations, we have the category for occupational risk group. Um, and then especially those working directly with humans. So healthcare workers, they come top on the list. So you have the clinicians, you have lab staff, patient attendants, you have, um, uh, clinical students. So clinician here meaning uh, doctors, nurses, clinical officers. So we recommend that all clinical staff have their hepatitis B vaccination. They also can have seasonal influenza vaccines uh, because they get exposed to very many patients, even children, and also they can have the typhoid vaccine for protection. So security personnel can be uh, police officers, armed forces, prison staff. And we re the recommendation is that they also get hepatitis B vaccine. They get the seasonal influenza vaccine uh, due to the higher risk of exposure and interaction with many people. Uh, the carers of people with the intellectual disability, those who are working in nursing homes. So the recommendation is that they also get uh, hepatitis B vaccine, they get the seasonal flu vaccine and the typhoid. Uh, apart from them getting exposed, they can also be able to pass the infection to vulnerable groups that they are attending to. So for protection also of the vulnerable clients, with the recommendation is that the carers needs to also be protected because if some of them can be asymptomatic carriers, then they can be able to infect um, vulnerable and uh, groups of people that they take care of who may have low immunity. 
animal handlers like veterinarian, veterinarians, their students, the rangers, okay, the police or uh, security companies who handle dogs or they train dogs. They need to get the recommendation is they get the the tetanus, the TB vaccine, the tetanus vaccine, and also the rabies prophylaxis. So the huntsmen who deal with the animals who are less likely to carry rabies, like the huntsmen, portly andras, abattoir workers, they need to have tetanus protection, like the recommendation. Personnel involved in relief operations who may go into uh, places where uh, there may be displaced people, uh, may go to different kinds of environment and meet different types of people. Uh, like in military, those who work with aid agencies and healthcare workers. Also the additional recommendation is uh, to get the cholera vaccine. Okay, so we have another occupational risk group, those who are not working directly with humans. Okay, so workers at risk of injuries, cuts, um, and like mechanics, machine operators, Juakali artisans, carpenters, and masons. The recommended vaccine is a tetanus vaccine for this group. The food handlers, you know, the chefs, the cooks, the waiters, the kitchen staff. So the recommendation is they get the typhoid vaccine. So um, other workers who are exposed to human tissue, or blood, body fluids, or sewerage treatment workers. So the, the exhaust workers, the plumbers, the recommendation is that they need to get hepatitis A vaccine and typhoid vaccine. Then we have the funeral home or mortuary workers a traditional circumciser, tattooist, then they need to get the hepatitis B vaccine. So, so other than an occupational risk group, so those who are exposed to human body fluids, body tissue, um, also sewerage, so like uh, sex industry workers, they advised also to get hepatitis B vaccine. Alcoholic and smokers, they can be able to get uh, tetanus um, vaccine and uh, the pneumococcal vaccine, the PCV-13. Travelers, so all travelers leaving the country must show approval, yellow fever vaccination, and it's usually a requirement uh, for entry in many countries and the need is to protect the people with the yellow fever. Those going for, for Hajj, the pilgrimage, the Hajj and Umrah pilgrimage, they advise also to get the Mingokoko vaccine because they'll be interacting from people from all over the world. They usually get the I mean, the advice, the recommendation is that you advise people going for uh, pilgrimage to get the meningococcal vaccine. So you, in case of a humanitarian crisis, you have, um, when you have refugee camps, they have internally displaced their people in camps due to flooding or conflict. We also advised to, uh, to avail the cholera vaccine, the recommendation is to avail the cholera vaccine for this group. Okay, so we have uh, another special group of uh, people is um, the high risk medical conditions. So we have uh, patient cancer patients, additional vaccines or boosters they need to get is the hepatitis B, the PCV-13 and the uh, PP, uh, 20 PPV 23. So they need to be able to get uh, the, these vaccines. The sickle cell, anemia, diabetes, um, asthma, and other chronic uh, diseases, they need to be able to get 
and the hepatitis B vaccine. Then we can get the PPV23 and the meningococcal vaccine and get the uh, seasonal influenza. So the PPV23 is, um, is a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine uh, related to the PCV, the pneumococcal conjugate uh, vaccine. So it says it's availing this pneumo protection against the pneumococcal in, in, in these uh, patients who are vulnerable, the cancer patients, the patient with chronic diseases. So the elderly need to be protected against the pneumococcal uh, infections and they can be able to get the PCV13 and the PPV23. So uh, persons infested with jiggers as they undergo treatment, remember to also give them the tetanus vaccine. We said it is a D TD, tetanus diphtheria vaccine. So in pregnancy, this is another special group. And so in pregnancy, uh, live attenuated vaccines are generally contraindicated during pregnancy uh, because they pose a theoretical risk to the fetus. So there is no evidence exists of risk to the fetus from vaccinating pregnant women with inactivated virus or bacteria or toxoid. Uh, but for lack of uh, the safety data, with the exception vaccines uh, recommended in pregnancy, such as the tetanus uh, vaccination, or are inactivated vaccines or toxoids should be administered only if the benefits outweigh the potential risk, when the likelihood of the disease exposure is high, and when infection could pose a risk to the mother or the fetus. So, it's again, in pregnancy, the recommendation is that it's generally considered safe to vaccinate pregnant women with the following vaccinations. The inactivated influenza vaccine can be given in pregnancy, tetanus vaccine, both the TT and the TD, so the tetanus toxoid and the tetanus diphtheria, both of them are safe and are given in pregnancy then hepatitis B and the meningococcal vaccine. So then we precaution, use the following vaccines with precaution and you can use, I'd been advised you can use them when the benefits outweigh the risk. So these uh, the vaccines we'll use with precautions are rabies vaccine, hepatitis A vaccine, the IPV, the inactivated polio vaccine or yellow fever. And they said you should be given when the benefits of two risk, especially with the live vaccines. So the following vaccines should not be administered to pregnant women. So the MMR, that the measles, mumps, rubella, the HPV, the varicella vaccines, they are generally live and attenuated a virus and live bacteria vaccines are not recommended for pregnant individuals due to their potential risk to the fetus. Okay, so that's the guide about uh, pregnancy. So use of the TD in pregnancy, we say that is a tetanus diphtheria scheduled for pregnancy. So in the first pregnancy, the first dose is given between the fourth and eighth month of pregnancy. Then the second dose is given one month after the first dose. So in the second pregnancy, you need one dose. So that will be the third dose will be given between fourth and eighth month. Then we have the, in the third pregnancy, so you need one dose that, the, that will be the fourth dose. Um, given between fourth and eighth month of the pregnancy. So in case there is a fourth pregnancy, so it, you'll get the fifth TD dose and is given between the fourth and the eighth month of pregnancy. So in case of any subsequent pregnancies, there's no need for more uh, tetanus diphtheria vaccine. 
because uh, by this time with uh, five doses, you will have achieved long-term immunity. So, so we, to minimize the, the risk and to avoid the threat of diphtheria outbreaks, WHO has recommended that all countries replace the tetanus toxoid vaccine with the tetanus diphtheria vaccine. And uh, already pointed out that it was for AMOF enhancing both uh, the it's enhancing the coverage for diphtheria vaccination. So it's the vaccine now given uh, is it's the one being used for vaccination of women of reproductive age or those who are pregnant. So how do we handle the HIV infected children? So WHO recommends that um, live vaccine should not be administered to children who are symptomatic, who are symptomatic for HIV. So you avoid the live vaccine. So as per the HIV testing strategy in Kenya, the HIV status of all children attending immunization in counties with over 5% HIV prevalence should be ascertained. So you should be able to keep testing even in the well baby uh, clinics. But you should not be able to deny vaccination in, uh, and you should, not, the, you should not peg vaccination to the testing. So immunization campaigns should be used as opportunity for HIV testing for children of unknown status. So we have said that the national vaccines and immunization programs, however, does not recommend testing for HIV before giving vaccination. So testing is encouraged, but do not peg it to vaccination. So those who will uh, offer to be tested well and good in case testing is not available or it's declined, you still go ahead and offer the vaccination. Asymptomatic infection with HIV is not a contraindication to vaccination, including the live ones, uh, which is the BCG and measles. All asymptomatic HIV infected children should receive BCG at birth and a dose of measles containing vaccine at six months. You say this is an extra one at six months, and the child should be able to receive the first dose of measles rubella at nine months and the second dose at 18 months. That means they'll have gotten three doses of MR. The first dose, the, this is dose only available to the HIV infected at six months. Then the routine one at nine months and the routine booster at 18 months for the MR vaccine. So the Ministry of Health position on BCG vaccination, so HIV exposed or an asymptomatic infected infants are to be vaccinated unless advised against by a pediatrician. For BCG vaccination of infants born to TB infected mothers, uh, please uh, refer to the TB uh, treatment guidelines. In the absence of a scar, despite documentation, documented vaccination having taken place, do not repeat vaccination. So if there is, there is a scar and there is documented vaccination, there is no need of repeating the vaccination. So even if there is, there is no scar, but there is documented vaccination, uh, do not repeat the vaccination. So in immunocompromised individuals, uh, other immunosuppressing uh, conditions apart from HIV, live vaccines are generally contraindicated. So um, we have uh, uh, both children and adults with immune inflammatory disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis, or certain primary immunodeficiencies such, that, uh, such as severe combined immunodeficiency, SCID, uh, 
Uh, so for these individuals, do not give life vaccines. They are generally contraindicated. This is due to the risk they could potentially, these vaccines could potentially overburden the immune system and result in an actual disease. In mild immunosuppression resulting from conditions such as renal failure, diabetes, alcoholic cirrhosis, cirrhosis asplenia, or sickle cell disease, the risk of contracting some diseases increased. Therefore, routine vaccination should be given. So they're already immunosuppressed, so their risk is higher, so they need protection. So for the ones with mild immunosuppression, vaccinate them. The ones with severe immunosuppression, avoid the live vaccines. So for preterm and low bad weight babies, and those, are, those who are less than uh, 2.5 kg, 2,500 grams, they should receive the BCG vaccine at the time of discharge from the hospital, irrespective of the current weight, um, meaning that they have been able to be stable enough to be discharged. If and uh, and most of the facilities will have a target target weight to achieve before going home. So if the preterm of low birth weight baby was born at home, BCG vaccination should be given at first contact with the health facility, just like all babies um, born at home. So if the child was not given either born at home or at the facility, in the first time it, this one is realized that's the time that they, they should be able to get the vaccination. Then the vaccination uh, schedule is then followed just like for other children and uh, thereafter. So we think we'll go to the question and answer session. Before that, um, it's to acknowledge uh, these uh, institutions. We have the Minister of Health, the Kenya Pediatric Association, and the Center for Disease and Control Prevention, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and, 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 the, and the number of people who are involved in writing. Uh, this, this, this presentation is part of um, a training module used by Kenya Pediatric Association and some of the people involved in those training, uh, like Dr. Christine Chege, um, I think she could be available in this webinar to be able to contribute and answer some of the questions. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, that was very session. I go straight to the questions. The first question goes on the BCG procedure to follow when they have they have a BCG scar uh, when the scar is not available and there is no documentation. So, if there is no scar and um, there is no evidence that it was given, I think it's it's safe to give because there is no evidence of giving. And so I think it's safe to give, but if the mother or anyone reports that this baby got the vaccine, then you don't repeat. So if it was given, then you don't repeat. But if it wasn't given, you give at the first contact. Then you follow the other vaccines um, as the schedule says. So you, you as if you where, wherever you get the child, even if they are at one year and they have never gotten any vaccination, that will be your first contact. You'll give the vaccine as if it's um, the first time that you're giving them. Then you'll follow the schedule as it is. So you'll space the vaccination the way they are. So at that contact, you'll give the, the pentavalent and uh, you'll give the PCV and the OPV. 
So then you'll give another 10 uh, after the four weeks and you space the vaccine uh, every four weeks and you change the schedule uh, factoring the spacing that was there initially. So because uh, we are giving at the six weeks, 10 weeks and 14 weeks. So wherever you have the first contact, that's where you start the schedule. Thank you so much for that. The other question is, what is the national recommendation for giving hepatitis B vaccine at birth by the time of OPV0 prior to release of the newborn from the hospital? This is the practice in a lot of private centers. Um, we, we, yeah, so we said that is the hepatitis B vaccine is available in the private sector and it is, um, it, 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 it's a schedule that has been captured by the National Vaccine and Immunization Program. Yeah, and um, it, it's only that it's not available for the public sector, probably due to cost issues, but it, it's a practice that is acknowledged and um, it's supported through the guideline by the Ministry of Health. No, no, yeah, so it's acknowledged to be there. Yeah, so I think the right terminology can be said it's acknowledged to be there. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a practice that um, the ministry is aware of that it prevents the, the hepatitis B uh, virus infection. And there's some talks with the, with, with in some several centers about uh, being able to promote also use of this um, hepatitis B virus uh, vaccine at birth for all children. But yeah, it's a practice that is there in the private sector and it's been captured in the, in the schedule that we saw and we highlighted that difference and we said um, that vaccine uh, has been recognized in the curriculum as a part of the available vaccines in the country. In connection to that, Boaz asks, why the private sector have various vaccines, yet Ministry of Health is the one the coordinating unit of all vaccines? So as uh, in the start, we said the Ministry of Health, yeah, yes, it's true, the ministry controls the the, the availability, the, the, the utilization, the Ministry of Health controls utilization of all vaccine. And the Ministry of Health provides the mandatory vaccines. So the mandatory vaccines are the vaccines which are to be available for all children. But, and we say the ministry uses the local epidemiology, uses the WHO position papers, on the various vaccines to be able to come up with, um, with a guide. So the Ministry of Health also focuses on issues like affordability. So, so it prioritizes the vaccines which will have the greatest impact and improve the care of most of the people. So if, the, if you have limited resources, you'll focus on um, what will have the greatest impact. And, so, and with time, you've seen some of the vaccines which we thought were, which had started in the private sector, eventually also being used in the public sector as more surveillance and more advocacy goes on. So it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion and being able to provide as much vaccine to as many children as possible, as we'll also utilizing the available resources. Thank you so much for that answer. World Health Organization said recommend single dose HPV vaccine between 10 to 19 years. When will MOH and NDIP adopt this? Has centers discussed the new recommendations? Okay, so uh, so the, as we are discussing, we saw there were a number of um, there are three vaccines which were available for HPV. So the one we are using for the national program is uh, HPV4. 
and we have HPV2 and HPV19. Nine. Nine, sorry. So, um, yeah, so I think this, um, the initial guideline was for the two doses for the girls. Yeah, so I think it's an ongoing discussion. So we can be able to see maybe if it's HPV9, which covers more serial groups, then we can be able to uh, discuss. But the local guide is that we give the two doses. Also, the local context could be the two doses can be able to cover more uh, more people than just one dose. So I think there are a number of factors, and I think is a question that um, we can forward to the, uh, the the advisory group on 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 what to consider. Which one will be more? Which will which will lead to more coverage? Could it be the one injection or the two injection? Thank you so much. Some there, was, there was a comment from Dr. Sorry. Mm -hmm. from, from Beth Maina. Dr. Beth Maina, great presentation. Kindly comment on the use of tetanus in immunoglobulin for suspected case of tetanus. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we had a list of the immunoglobulins, and I uh, think was tetanus one of them. So we have a list of the immunoglobulins available. And yeah, and the tetanus immunoglobulins are available and they can be used for suspected tetanus. The other question, some, some advice reading one dose of the nigococcal vaccine called numerics as compared to the menactra two doses. The other question is, as we, we get to that, if a child misses rotavirus vaccine, can we still give after 14 weeks and at which, po which point do we receive the BCG and the quantity? Yeah, so I think the last one, we, you have agreed that we are not repeating BCG if there's any evidence it was given, even if there was no scar uh, formed. So the other question. The other question was. About oh, yeah. the, the, some advice on the dosage of numerics and menactra. And there's still another question on the numerics vaccine. Which one do we go for? The one dose or the two dose? That's the question. OK, so. We'll get back yeah, to you. Uh -huh. What are the current national recommendations for COVID vaccine across age groups? So I think for COVID, we are still using the, the recent MOH guidelines. Yeah, so not for all children, so we'll still use the, the recent MOH guidelines on the vaccination. The other question is, what is the schedule for vaccine for high-risk patients? That is from Elisa. Do you give tetanus with diphtheria vaccine to which kind of group? It is not quite clear. That is from Nancy. What is the difference between TT and TB use? When and why? That's about the TT. I'll oh, take yeah. you through the questions for TT. Okay. What about a woman desiring only nine or two, only one or two babies? Will one or three doses of TT vaccine be sufficient? Does the spacing of pregnancy affect the efficiency of vaccine? For example, if gap between one and second pregnancy is 12 years? Maybe you can answer those ones. Okay, so quite a number for the TT. So I hope I remember all of them. So for the, the we say the WHO was uh, re recommending use of um, TD, the tetanus diphtheria vaccine in, in place of TT, tetanus toxoid vaccine. So tetanus was just the tetanus on its own, TD 
uh, as, in, as included um, the diphtheria, tetanus and uh, diphtheria. So wherever you are using TT, you can now use TD for occupational um, use and in pregnancy and especially in pregnancy. So uh, then, so there was a question about the spacing of pregnancy of, of the of 12 years. Uh, so if I think in, in one of the schedule, the, especially the one for the trauma, which we had uh, shown earlier on, it will show that if you, if you get the three doses within six months, you can get up to five years protection. Also, so if, if the spacing is longer than that, I think it's good to start all over again, especially if it's longer than 10 years, because with the fourth dose, if you're able to get the fourth, four doses within a year, if you're able to get four doses within, um, that should be within one year and seven months, if you're able to get the four doses, then you can get up to 10 years protection. So if you only got two doses and uh, it's now 10 years, I think it's advisable to start all over again because we had seen that you can be able to get up to 10 years protection from four doses if those doses were given within one year, seven months. So if it's 10 years with only two doses, it's advisable you start all over again. So get the two doses, the ones you get at uh, pregnant. Is it recommended to give PCV for adults with chest trauma? Can HPV be given in above 12 year old girls? Okay, yes, you can get the PCV PCV can be given and we saw it can be given in the, even the PPV, it can be given in the elderly, in the people who have a risk of a pneumococcal infection, those who are smokers, they can be able to get the, the PCV vaccine. And then um, we saw the only major, um, even the elderly, apart from those who have severe, um, it's not a live vaccine. So you can be able to get, to give even to the elderly and especially uh, the ones who have at risk of um, infection. And we are so even those who are smokers. So the other question is? The other question is the vaccine, the vaccine booklet leaves a space for death BCG repeat big scan or two. Does this give health, health worker the way to repeat the vaccination. The other question on the, so, around the same, what if a baby is born 24 weeks, that before term? So when do such babies get the vaccination? Do we wait for them to get the exact age of birth or do we, do you just issue assuming they are born? So uh, for the BCG, we have a new, mother to child booklet. I think it's, uh, the version is 2020. It should have uh, some of the updates and uh, that um, especially um, discouraging repeating BCG if it was given. So the key thing is to document that it has been given. So with or uh, without scar formation, we are not repeating. Then babies who are born preterm, we are said you will give the BCG on discharge. So here the discharge means they are stable to be immunized, they are stable to go home, and most likely they have achieved the, the weight uh, required to, to go home. So the guide is that um, they need to get the vaccine uh, as uh, during discharge before they go home, they get their vaccines when they are stable to go home. The next question is, have the policy changed from measles alone to combine measles and rubella vaccines? Yes, for some time, even in the national policy, we have been having the MR, that is the measles and the rubella 
combined vaccine given uh, in the in the upper arm uh, in the deltoid muscle. The other one is pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, a part of national immunization program. Yes, we give uh, pentavalent. We, we give the pentavalent and uh, PCV10 at the same time, at the same sitting. So it's part of the national program. Now the child gets two injections uh, on week on um, week uh, six and week 10, they get uh, two injections. And on week 14, the, uh, the third visit, they get three injections. So they'll get the pentavalent, they get the PCV10, and they get the IPV. So the pentavalent is usually given on the left uh, thigh. So the, the, the PCV and the IPV, is they are given on the right thigh and the spacing uh, between the penta, the PCV injection and the IPV injection. So the child gets three jabs in one visit. So PCV, yes, it's part of the national program. Thank you. What are the World Health Organization requirements before you receive hepatitis B vaccine, RDNA? So the one we have seen is um, the 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 one we have seen is that yeah, the birth you can give at birth, and the one we have seen the recommendation is giving the vaccine at birth, and also you have seen for the high risk groups, and you have been able to list them, including healthcare workers who need to get the. The, the we need to receive the hepatitis B vaccine. Thank you so much. It is quite a lot of questions. We will combine them. What would you say about flu vaccine on cho children going to school and the guidance on antigen quantification ideal stock? Mm, so so it said flu vaccine it can be given from six months okay and they are available in the private sector and they can be they they, they think um oh, what was that yeah they're available and they're given from six months mostly annually the other question was What's the guidance on antigen quantification for ideal stocks? Uh, so the, that goes to vaccine management. It has a lot of uh, variables, including the target population. Yeah, so yeah, so that that goes depends from case to case. I think depending on the target um, population. For tetanus diphtheria vaccine in a pregnant woman who missed a dose in the third pregnancy, do you compensate for the missed one in subsequent pregnancy? Question number two, for a woman who has delivered a few months ago and she got the TB vaccine while pregnant, do you give the tetanus vaccine when she presents to you with a cut wound? Um. So yeah, yes, you can give. We said you can give the TD uh, even one month if there's an indication from the initial dosage. Okay, and then the one for the mixing of the third. The mixing of the third dose. And we saw earlier the first dose usually that will not offer. Uh, will not have a long duration of immunity. Will not will offer minimal immunity. Okay, so and then the second dose we said it can be given one month after the first dose, and can protect for one to three years. So the question was if the you. Bad. 
Protetiveness is the idea. Mm -hmm. Vaccine in a pregnant woman who needs a dose in that pregnancy. Do you compensate for the missed one in subsequent pregnancy? So if they miss the, the, third, the third pregnancy. The missed a dose in the third pregnancy. Okay. Do you mm -hmm. compensate for the missed one in the subsequent pregnancy? Now the fourth pregnancy. So the fourth pregnancy, they'll get one dose. So after the only pregnancy that you get two doses is the first pregnancy. Thereafter is one dose per pregnancy. If one has ever received the travel yellow, vac yellow fever vaccine, should it be repeated after 10 years or it is lifelong? I think the recent guide from the WHO is that the yellow fever vaccine the vaccination is now lifelong. There's no need of repeating after 10 years. And uh, even as you travel, most of the, the, the immigration or the port health people should be aware that the immunization with yellow fever is now lifelong. Thank you so much for that comprehensive answer. We come to the end of our session today. Is there any question that I have left out? Thank you, Shia. We have seven minutes to go. Any question that has been left out? Any question? Okay. Is there anything else? One more question that is burning. What is the rationale for giving OPV and IPV concurrently? So IPV is uh, giving injection and it pro it's it's um so it's it's it eliminates also it has two components. It offers that individual protection and it also reduces the risk of anyone developing polio after receiving the live oral, oral polio vaccine. So yeah, so that's the, the reason for combining the, the, the two 
the two vaccines. So it boosts the individual immunity and also, also offers additional protection of providing the individual from also developing um, uh, uh, polio because uh, the oral polio is a, is a live vaccine also. One more question. What happens to mothers who shift from private to public hospital leading to changes in schedules? No, I've said for, for the, 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 the schedules in private and the public sector, they are complementary. And we see it's only that additional vaccines are available in the private sector, but they are complementing each other. And the schedule is the same. Okay, it's only that during the certain visit, there's additional vaccine to get. So uh, there should be no confusion. It's only that uh, there are additional vaccines in the private sector, which are not in the public sector, but the two schedules should be complementary. We have come to the end of our session today. Thank you so much, everyone who has attended. I've been your moderator.